Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Carl Brook. I am the Managing Director for the International Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement, or IDES. Welcome to our second webinar on performance measurement in environmental compliance and enforcement. This is the second in a series of five. The next one will take place next Tuesday, uh, February 7th at the same time. We're going to be looking at um, approaches, lessons, and considerations in trying to measure um, performance related to environmental compliance and enforcement. We're using these webinars as an opportunity both to share experiences from experts uh, such as uh, Dr. Jay Shimchak, who's uh, going to be speaking today, and Michael Enns, who uh, spoke um, at the first webinar, but also trying to facilitate an exchange, to collect experiences from among uh, the community, and digesting all of those, that information into a, a white paper that will be circulated first to the people who participated in the webinars, and then more broadly. I'd like to introduce our speaker today uh, and then go around briefly uh, so that we, people can see who uh, else is on the call. Uh, Jay Shimshak is an Associate Professor of Public Policy and Economics at the University of Virginia. Uh, prior to UVA, uh, Professor Shimshak held positions at Tulane University and at Tufts University, where he was a visiting faculty fellow um, at the end, and he was a visiting faculty fellow at the University of Michigan. His research focuses on environmental regulation, environmental economics, and applied microeconomics for public policy. He has particular expertise in the monitoring and enforcement, uh, monitoring and evaluation of environmental laws, um, corporate social responsibility, information and transparency as policy, and environmental health. He's the co-editor of the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management, and he's written several white papers for EPA, testified for four of the U.S. House of Representatives, and published numerous policy-oriented book chapters and outreach papers. He will give a presentation of approximately 20 minutes, and we'll follow that with a moderated question and answer. Um, and at this point, I'd like to uh, um, invite people to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, just Hello. briefly, you know, what your name is, where you're from, um, and uh, um, uh, then we can go and then we'll turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Shimshak. Uh, if you could um, uh, raise your hand in the GoToWebinar toolbar, uh, we'll call the participants one at a time. So this is also an exercise there. Okay, Michael, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm actually Michelle Kiras. I'm an analyst under Mike. He's unable unable to attend um, this webinar, so I'm taking his place. Welcome. Thank you. And so uh, others, uh, if you can use the uh, raise your hand and we'll then just go through quickly. Or do we? Or would it be easier just to call on people? Uh, Lawrence, go ahead. Hi, uh, Lawrence Baschak with uh, Government of Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment. Uh, we have actually a, a group in our meeting room here. Um, and quickly, uh, introductions. Just Eric Lise, Risk Management. Elaine Lenton, Public Service. Charlotte Molaski, Public Service. Sean Robinson, Policy Analyst. Tony Campbell, uh, Strategic Analyst. Sarah Daniel, co uh, Development Advisor. That is all from Regina, Saskatchewan. That's all, huh? That's a good group. Okay. Um, and then let's just go through. Okay. So, Ahmad, um, would you care to introduce yourself? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you fine, thank you. Okay, thank you very much now. I am Ahmad Madavi, a retired professor from the University of Tehran. It's uh, more than a decade that I'm trying to really make enforcement in developing, in Middle East, you know, more. 
about uh, toxic and so that's very important for me and I missed the first one unfortunately. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dale? Dale Christoph? Dale Christoph, Minister of Environment, Saskatchewan. I've got a few other people here uh, just watching. Yes, I'm uh, EPA's Office of Compliance. Uh, Daniel Palmer, Dan Palmer. Dan, hey. go ahead. Okay, this is Dan Palmer at uh, US EPA in Washington, D.C., in uh, the Office of Compliance here. Excellent. Um, and uh, Gandhi? I guess Gandhi's still muted. Um, uh, let's go on to uh, Gerald. Uh, Gerald? Yeah. Could Hello. You speak to Hello, Jerry Woodrick, Environmental Protection Branch, Saskatoon. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Greta? Greta? I'm not sure. We have already, already taken a consistent address. I hope we can. So it was a few days. Sometimes offices go to the lowest common denominator. But it's um, and uh, Laurie Fugario? Lori? Hi, this is Lori Frigerio with uh, Office of Compliance. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Lynn Hickey? Uh, Mark Pancho? Mark, please uh, go ahead. Mark, can you hear us? Nabil? Excuse me, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. We can hear you now. Okay, thank you. It's uh, Mark Pacho. I'm an inspector, government of Saskatchewan with the Ministry of Environment, uh, Compliance and Field Services branch. Uh, I'm uh, headquartered out of Metal Lake, Saskatchewan. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Nabil Hawk? Uh, we can hear you. It's uh, Chalky. Uh, yeah, my name is Nabil Haq. Uh, I'm currently at the EP student at Stonewood University of Hawaii and Environmental Advisor for GIZ in Bangladesh. Thank you. Norman Kadir? Tanya Shajanian? Hi, yeah, this is Tanya. I'm an intern at Eli. And uh, Timothy Nicholson. Hi, I'm Tim from the Office of Compliance. Hi, Tim. And then um, oh, Ed Messina, I think, uh, joined in the midst of the calls. Um, Ed, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah, I'm here. OK, and uh, in the room we have? Uh, Jay Pendergrass, uh, Vice President of the BLI, and uh, uh, Special Advisor to the uh, ben Solomon Schwartz, uh, law fellow at ELI and work with INIS Secretary. Hi, I'm, I'm Evan McKinney. Uh, I've been working with the INIS Secretary to organize these webinars and carry out other INIS functions. Thank you all. Um, and uh, Jay, I'd like to turn the floor over to you now. Um, 
Okay, sorry, uh, we have unmuted you. Are you unmuted on your end, Jay? Uh, you're self-muted. I think. How about now? That's good. Progress. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here. I will uh, share my slides here in a minute. Uh, my name is Jay Shimshek. I'm a professor of public policy and economics at the University of Virginia. I've been interested in environmental uh, compliance and enforcement issues for uh, almost two decades now and uh, have been working actively in the subjects uh, for pretty much that entire time. So um, my goal for the day is take the next 15 or 20 minutes and just uh, set the stage uh, for the conversation that follows. Obviously in 15 to 20 minutes I will not be able to provide too many of the nitty-gritty details but provide a context for discussion and, and the discussions that follow on future days. So does that sound, uh, sound okay to everyone? Please, please go ahead. Will do. So again, my goal for today is to discuss how to measure compliance and performance effects of monitoring and enforcement. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. So uh, things that um, I, I think are useful to set the stage before we move forward is to understand that the monitoring and enforcement toolkit is extensive. I don't think anyone on this call will be surprised by this comment, but we want to think about sort of evaluating the effects of monitoring and enforcement, it's very important that we keep a few things in mind. And the first is that this toolkit is very large. So approaches to traditional monitoring might include things like continuous emissions monitoring systems. They might include self-reported emissions. Uh, and those self-reported emissions may or may not then be coupled with frequent uh, on-site inspections to help ensure the accuracy of self-reporting. Uh, it's also possible that on-site inspections, whether they be frequent or infrequent, uh, serve as the sole source of compliance information. Uh, so that's traditional monitoring. On the traditional sanction side, uh, we have options like informal enforcement actions like phone calls and warning letters, formal administrative penalties, which might be range from field citations to administrative consent orders that involve financial fines, uh, and then finally, uh, more severe civil and, and even criminal penalties. The toolkit uh, more recently is being expanded to include other tools for achieving environmental compliance, especially environmental compliance with lower public and private resource expenditures. And this might entail things like uh, innovative regulation and permit design to make compliance the default, might involve advanced monitoring technologies, electronic reporting, uh, transparency and disclosure policies, ways to leverage traditional enforcement using information, and innovative enforcement approach, approaches that may include things like uh, third-party private-public partnerships. So the monitoring and enforcement toolkit is uh, reasonably large, and each of these tools has the potential to influence entity behavior in a number of different ways. So the one I think that we're most familiar with and most of us think about when we think about the effects of monitoring and enforcement on pollution and compliance are direct effects. For example, inspections may simply identify easily correctable noncompliance. Sanctions may demand immediate abatement as part of the compliance agreement. And so these are very direct effects of enforcement actions on outcomes associated with environmental performance and compliance. However, one might anticipate that monitoring and enforcement has other effects. So one is uh, specific deterrence. Here the issue is it may not be the case that a monitoring and enforcement action not only involves easily or immediately correctable harm, but also may reduce uh, violations into the future for the agency that received, say, the sanction. So specific deterrence is the effect of monitoring and enforcement on subsequent compliance incidents by the same firm. Note that that is distinct, but of course related to the broader notions of general deterrence. It is also the case that an enforcement action at one entity 
may spill over to affect performance at other entities. And the way we typically think about this is an enforcement action at one entity may signal that the regulator is getting tough, for example, uh, and therefore all of the other facilities may also change their behavior in response to an enforcement action at a different facility. And then the final way that monitoring enforcement can influence entity behavior is monitoring enforcement can actually spur beyond compliance behavior. Uh, and this sounds a little bit counterintuitive in the sense, why would an enforcement action, for instance, uh, cause a facility to actually reduce its pollution emissions even further below its statutory limit than it was already doing? And the answer is actually ex post are pretty intuitive, even if it doesn't seem to make sense ex ante, is that suppose there's some randomness to pollution violations in which we know that that's the case. If I want to reduce the probability of an accidental violation, I may actually reduce my target level of pollution even further below my statutory limit. And the other thing is pollutants are jointly determined. They're jointly abated and they're jointly produced as a function of the activities of the facility. And so the upshot here is I may be worried about a potential violation for a pollutant, say total suspended solids, and the activities I take to reduce uh, the possibility of a violation for total suspended solids may indeed also reduce biochemical oxygen demand, for example. So the upshot is monitoring enforcement can influence entity behavior in a number of ways. And then finally, again, things that uh, I know this crowd I don't need to emphasize too much, but it is worth uh, repeating. Performance and compliance is it's very complex. So facilities are regulated under many, many, many different programs. So for example, air, water, land, etc. Nearly all programs regulate a large number of pollutants simultaneously. So in the water pollution context, suspended solids, biochemical oxygen demand, you might have some metals, pHs, et cetera. Pollutants may be subject to different types of limits, quantity limits, concentration limits. Uh, it depends on what you're thinking. Uh, those regulations may be subject to you know, short run maximums. They may be subject to longer period averages. And even for the same facility and the same regulatory program, Pollutants may be regulated over many, many different compliance period lengths. So it could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a quarter, it could be a year. And then finally, when we think about determining environmental compliance, it's determined not only by pollution and compliance in emissions terms, but also in terms of procedural activities, which include things like failure to submit timely uh, and accurate self-reports, inadequate equipment installation, not meeting obligations under a permit or a consent decree. So the upshot is uh, performance here is quite complex. And so the point of all of this setting before I get into the meat is to just remind everyone that measuring performance for environmental compliance and enforcement uh, can and in, and in virtually all cases is quite challenging. Nevertheless, uh, it's definitely also worth reminding everyone that it's essential, especially at a time where agencies are consistently being asked to do uh, more with less. So in other words, to achieve greater compliance with fewer resources. And to just give you a flavor of some of the promise of quantitative approaches to measuring uh, the impacts of enforcement, um, deterrence measurement can do things like allow regulatory agencies to make data-driven statements about the impacts of their activities to external stakeholders. So the way I think about this is this allows the promise of uh, agencies to be able to communicate the benefits and cost of their activities to external stakeholders. In addition, quantitative measurement uh, can also aid internal agency management, uh, basically by identifying the types of inspections, monitoring and enforcement tools uh, that generate the biggest bang per buck. Other things you can think about is finding the industries or facility characteristics that might be associated with especially large uh, regulatory bang per buck. So these are uh, very promising uh, endpoints, at least in, uh, in my assessment. So just a little bit more on that. Uh, 
it's usually worthwhile for me to remind people that from where I'm sitting, uh, the commonly used metrics to measure performance are things like how many inspections did we have, how many fines did we impose, how many dollars were associated with those fines, and then maybe a little bit more directly things like what were the specific cleanup requirements and court orders. And these have clear advantages. They're unambiguous. It's very clear. Um, but they also have very strong disadvantages. And the main disadvantage is these are not credibly linked to their impacts on violations and pollution. So let me give you just two very extreme examples to drive home the point. Um, suppose we had a case where there was perfect compliance. So everybody is complying. In that situation, we would not expect to see any fines or any penalty dollars assessed, nor would we see any cleanup requirements in court orders or administrative orders. So in that case, we would say, uh, you know, actually, it looks like the enforcement agency is doing a bad job on these common metrics because it's not using any fines or any penalties uh, it may even be conducting few inspections. Maybe the more intuitive one is to look at the opposite case where uh, the basic idea is um, you have perfect compliance and there are no fines imposed and no penalties assessed because everything is terrific. And if everything is terrific, it looks like the agency is doing nothing, but instead the agency is in fact achieving great outcomes. The key point here is when I look at the metrics that are commonly used by agencies to measure their performance, those are not linked to violations, and I'm happy to discuss more about that. In addition, the reason I started with the general setting of thinking about the way that monitoring and enforcement actions may affect pollution and compliance, it's important to understand that these more direct measures do not pick up things like the effects of an intervention on the subsequent behavior of the firm or the spillover effects of an enforcement or monitoring action on one firm on other regulated entities, nor does it pick up any potential for beyond compliance behavior. When an enforcement regime is getting tough, this may cause a number of facilities to actually, on most pollutants, reduce their pollution even further, and that would not be picked up by these traditional approaches. So what are our options? So that's sort of the setting, the first 10 minutes. Now I'll take the next 10 minutes to hit on some potential options. Um, so the most common option to quantitatively measuring impacts uh, for performance and compliance, or at least maybe common is the wrong word, but the most uh, natural option for doing so is randomized control trials. So certainly many of you have heard these phrases before. They come up in uh, medicine, other social policy areas very frequently. This little, uh, this little uh, figure I have here is an example of a sort of a default job training program. The basic idea is the population is split by random lot into two groups. The top group receives some intervention like a job training program. The bottom group does not receive the intervention. And then we look at the outcomes in this case, you know, uh, the same number of people found work with and without the job training program, so it doesn't appear that this one had big impacts. Uh, obviously, none of us on this call are directly interested in job training programs, but this is sort of the easiest way to think about this. Um, field experiments or randomized control trials uh, are very, very, very promising in monitoring enforcement settings. Uh, given good research design, they automatically achieve credible causal attribution. The analysis is actually quite easy, uh, and I will tell all of you on this call that researchers are often very, very, very happy to uh, help with design and evaluation. Um, uh, I'm often not popular with my research colleagues when I say the following. Um, researchers are very frequently happy to help with design and evaluation of good randomized control trials even without resources, because these are promising uh, evaluations both to inform the real world but also to inform the academic literature. So 
Um, we have a large number and a rapidly growing number of compliance randomized control trials in settings uh, that are very, very, very broad, tax compliance, environmental compliance, uh, compliance with environmental and health, excuse me, environmental health and safety uh, situations. So some randomized control trials do things like they randomize inspection types, like a reconnaissance inspection versus a slightly more involved inspection. Inspections versus self-audits. So the idea is uh, either an inspector or the firm itself would complete an audit form that looks exactly identical, and you would look at the difference in whether those self-audits are being accurately described. Auditor type, whether the nature and form of the auditor itself, is it a third-party auditor, is it an auditor paid by the facility, is it an audit, auditor paid by the regulator. Uh, enforcement action variability, so you might randomize uh, for a bunch of violators, some violators uh, would get no enforcement action, some violators might get a minor one, and some would get uh, a more severe type. You can randomize messaging about how frequently you expect to inspect facilities or you expect to issue penalties. Messaging about social comparisons, did you know that your facility uh, violates far more frequently than other facilities in your industry and in your region. You can randomize approaches to naming and shaming uh, poor performers or naming and proclaiming good performers. You can randomize uh, permit design so you can make some permits more complex. You can make some less complex and see if that has implications for compliance outcomes. You can randomize training programs and compliance assistance. And there's a very, very large literature here. These slides will be available, so the citations uh, will be listed on the slides. And uh, for those of you that are interested, please don't hesitate to send me an email if uh, you're unable to find any of these citations moving forward. Uh, one of the things is a lot of agencies think, well, uh, you know, this is not how we behave. And uh, I think it's important to remember that environmental agencies actually run thousands of uncontrolled experiments every year, and there is enormous variation in all those things that we discussed on the preceding page across time, across space, across facilities, etc. And the basic idea is a small amount of additional effort could allow these to be controlled experiments to build in evaluation and understand which things work best at the lowest uh, cost in terms of social resources. So despite considerable promise, randomized control trials can be expensive. They can be logistically challenging. In some cases that involve things like information treatments, they can be discouraged by law like Paperwork Reduction Acts, or in many cases discouraged by agency culture. I think there are solutions to many, if not all, of these issues. Uh, if you find the right partners uh, on both sides, many of these things can be addressed. Nevertheless, RCTs can be difficult, uh, and uh, they may have to examine treatments that are less important than, than some things that are first order from the agency's perspective. So what are our alternatives? An alternative is to use administrative data to measure the impacts of interventions. So I'll just give you a few highlights here. Um, the idea is to look at deterrence. How do plants' compliance and pollution change in response to changes in monitoring and enforcement activities uh, or the threats of monitoring and enforcement activities over time? And the basic strategy is to use regression analysis where I would look at something like compliance and pollution. I'd look at the relationship between a facility's compliance and inspection and enforcement actions recently directed at the plant after controlling for other determinants of inspection, enforcement, and compliance. And I would do that for a large number of facilities over a reasonable number of periods of time. And I would help to try to understand uh, the deterrence effects. So just returning to the setting, compliance is difficult to define. So many empirical outcomes are available. You could think about if I want to define compliance as just a 0, 1, in compliance, not in compliance. This could be, do I have a violation for a given pollutant in a given month? Do I have a violation for any pollutant in a given month? 
Do I have a significant, an agency determined official significant violation in a given month, quarter, or year? Um, do I have any procedural violation or emissions violation? Or I could have con continuous performance metrics like the number of violations, how long does noncompliance last, or actual pollution, either sort of in absolute terms or relative to the permits. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide here in the interest of time. It's important to note that credible attribution inferring causality from correlation and regression analysis is difficult. There are a lot of concerns, omitted variable bias. You are concerned that a relationship between enforcement activity and compliance may be driven by things that both influence enforcement activity and directly influence compliance, like community pressure. A very active community may lead an enforcement agency to be very active in enforcement, as well as the firms in that area to be especially likely to comply. If you don't control for that, you may uh, think that the enforcement activity is driving the outcome when it's really community characteristics. Reverse causality through regulator targeting. There are ways to deal with this. I am delighted to talk about these issues in more detail, both now and in the future. Um, but um, I'll just basically say that you can evaluate situations where inspections or enforcement regimes approximate randomness. They have the idea of a randomized control trial with institutional or administrative data. Uh, you use statistical techniques or proxy variables, or you can focus on questions or research designs that are less susceptible to emitted variable bias and reverse causality concerns. Those are the spillover effects, the effects of large-scale policy or rule changes, or situations where institutional details can be exploited. And again, I, I'm delighted to talk more about that. Um, very quickly, Self-reporting is a little different. Self-reporting is often essential, as the size of our regulated universes are enormous. Theory suggests mandatory self-reporting can actually produce accurate outcomes and be cost-effective. Um, but quantitatively measuring the accuracy of self-reporting is different than these other approaches. It can be done with randomized controlled trials and or informed with laboratory experiments. But when I'm using observational or administrative data, the basic idea is uh, you still have another of a number of options. Intentional misreporting can often lead to statistical signatures that can be detected in the data with forensic statistical techniques. There are lots of these, Benford's Law, repeated values, uh, inspector timing. Do basically reported emissions look different when an inspector is on site versus when an inspector is not? Comparisons to independent data sources like ambient air quality or ambient water quality of the receiving waters, etc. So my final slide is to just note uh, that I've sort of set the stage. I've given you a flavor of what these tools might look like. But I do want to emphasize that quantitative deterrence measurement is very important, but it is only one tool. Uh, quantitative approaches are often not well suited to going inside what I would call the black box of regulated entity decision making. They're often not well suited to extremely data poor regulatory settings like those involving very small uh, regulated entities, although RCTs may still be applicable. Uh, and in truth, all of these things can be difficult to execute carefully, uh, even with expert assistance, but there are many people willing to help. So a qualitative approaches like surveys, et cetera, uh, are also very crucial. I list a few down here. Uh, Les Carlo in the state of Oregon has done some incredibly uh, interesting uh, qualitative approaches to measuring the uh, compliance and performance effects of interventions as well. So that is what I had for you to set the stage for the conversation that follows.